I'm State Representative Linda Schlegel Culver. We're here at Martz's Game Farm this morning for a update on legislative report. And with me today I have uh, Mike Martz and Cindy Martz. Uh, Mike is currently running this family-owned business. Thank you for joining us today. Sure. Um, what we want to do today is everybody's heard about Martz's Game Farm, but a lot of people don't really know what goes on here. So this is a family-run business, fourth mm -hmm. generation. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the history of you know, how the game farm started um, and just how it passed down through the family? Sure. In uh, 1955, my grandfather, Harold Martz, uh, the late Harold Martz, started the business. Uh, the way it started was he was approached by some doctors and lawyers primarily from the Sunbury, Williamsport area. And back then, the pheasant hunting was very good in Pennsylvania at that time, but they wanted to be able to shoot more than two pheasants per day. So what they did was they talked him into starting a hunting preserve where he would raise some of the birds and release them, and they would come down here. And it was a club of one dozen members, and that's pretty much how things started. They, they got memberships, and they, those 12 guys hunted, and they brought guests here. And then it just kind of took off from there. And that was in what year? Well, the game farm was started in 1955, I should correct that, and, and he primarily raised pheasants for meat purposes at that time, and then in 1957 was actually when the hunting preserve actually started, so it's, it's been, been almost, uh, I guess that would be 65, 55 years. And how have you grown since? the inception of the business? Well, at that time, he raised about 3,000 pheasants per year. And this year, we're raising about 120,000 mature pheasants and 25,000 mature chucker partridge and about five to 10,000 Hungarian partridge. So we, we raise a variety of game birds now. And you know, it's taken off since then quite a bit, since 1955. And your clientele now is, I believe, comes from farther than just Sunbury and Williamsport. Yes, they come from all the surrounding states. Uh, Primarily, most of our, a lot of our business comes from like the eastern half of Pennsylvania. I'd say that's probably 85% of, of our of business. And, uh, you know, it's, we're open to me memberships now, but you don't need a membership to hunt here. Back then, when it originated, there were charter members, and the only they could hunt here, they could bring guests. Now we're open to the public, and we've been open to the public for, uh, you know, over 30 years. And as the business has grown, um, I mean, I assume this started out with just the family working the business. And over the years, it's grown to how many employees? Well, we have uh, over 50 employees in the payroll. Uh, most of them are seasonal and part-time. We have uh, nine full-time employees right now and about four regular uh, helpers and ad workers in addition to that. You know, some people that are retired that want to work three or four days a week and that sort of thing. And when this passed down to you, um, your vision for the business or how it's changed since you've taken over and run it? My vision was not to screw it up. <laughs> And, and you know, try to try to keep doing what we always did, and uh, keep you know, try to keep good employees, which we have done, and we're blessed that way. And uh, you know, we have we have grown. We've been fortunate enough to grow since then. And I think some of that has been feed prices, uh, where a lot of the bigger operators have been able to stay in business with more volume, and a lot of the smaller operators, feed prices, their overheads just went way up, and it's been really tough because uh, that's something not a lot of people probably outside the agriculture industry understand is that, you know, the feed prices are, that's our biggest, uh, biggest expense right now. And it's uh, somebody that doesn't have much labor expense, you know, that's their main expense is feed prices. So that's allowed us to actually expand a little bit since I took over. But the, the profit margin per bird is, is less than it was, you know, 10 or 15, 20 years ago. So if somebody wanted to come and hunt here, uh, what would they need to do? Uh, basically, just, you know, they could go on our website at www.martzes.com or call our office at 800-326-8442. Uh, they could call here to the office. We have two great secretaries that could take a reservation or answer questions that they would have. Uh, most of the time, sometimes people want to come and see the place first and get a little tour. That's something we've done uh, this year several times. And, uh, you know, like I said, we're open to the public and open for questions. and. Uh, we go to the Harrisburg Eastern Sportsman Show. We'll be there this year that the National Rifle Association took over. And uh, we also go to the Allentown Show and uh, Cabela's Show. So that's one of our forms of advertising. But the uh, biggest thing is the website, I would say. So, and one of the things, too, um, is that when we have people that come in to do a tour, 
predominantly that would be people who own and operate businesses and they want to bring people, clients here for entertainment purposes. Yeah. So they want to come and check everything out before they bring clients for entertainment. Yeah. Very good. Wait, yeah. So I mean, our, <clears throat> our primary, what we, what we try to do on the hunting preserve side of things, we have two different business entities. We have the Martz's Game Farm, where we sell about 85% of the birds that we raise. Only 12 to 15% of the birds that we raised we actually, are actually released here and hunted here. But our goal on the hunting preserve entity is to give as wild of an experience as possible, you know, as far as the cover and things like that. We have a lot of people, a lot of hunters that hunt out in South Dakota, and they use this as a way of keeping their dog sharp. And yeah, you know, I'm not going to lie or try to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. It's not exactly like hunting South Dakota, but it's probably as close as you can get here. And that's, that's our goal on the hunting preserve side of things. So someone who does not hunt is thinking about getting involved in hunting or perhaps has a child who's interested in outdoor sports. What experience can they expect or could they experience when they come here? Well, we have a sporting clay range. You know, hunting isn't for everybody and we don't begrudge anybody for that. We have people come here and just like to shoot sporting clays and, and things like that. And uh, there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. We've had wedding parties come here, bachelor parties uh, to just shoot sporting clays. But uh, one of the things, you know, lately has been the show Duck Commander, where a lot of non-hunters are watching. Right. And it's actually sparking some interest with uh, youth hunters wanting to start hunting. And we've had several people bring young people here and say, these kids have never hunted before, their parents don't hunt but they wanted to start hunting and we're gonna teach them how to hunt and this is what sparked their interest, Duck Commander. And what's really neat is it's just, it's a family, it's a generational thing. Right. So we have people that come here and you have grandpa and you have dad and then you have right. the, the son or daughter of uh, grandpa and so they're going out and they're creating memories for their family uh, by doing things together. Some of them come Thanksgiving morning and then they go home and they eat a cooked meal. I mean, they have traditions. It, it creates traditions for families. And we also have a couple specials that we do. We try to promote <clears throat> youth. We try to promote women hunting, women in the outdoors. Uh, we try to promote senior citizens. We have two specials uh, in early October every year. It's a half price hunt. Uh, the one day it's for women and youth 17 or under. And then we also the following week have a special half price hunt for senior citizens or United States military veterans or active personnel as well. So. We have a lot of respect for all them areas and we just want to promote the sport of you know, hunting and the outdoors because it's something that's becoming a lost art to many. So for those people coming in from out of the area, it's my understanding we have some accommodations? Yes, we do. Okay, and they are fed here, well fed if I understand correctly. Well, that would be a continental shoot. That's when we do the meals. Okay. Um, they come here, they, they go up on the hill, they do a, a continental shoot. Then they come back here. Don's mom, who is... Um, you know, the senior, she was involved when the business began. And she still, at 87 years of age, is cooking. That's wonderful. For those meals. Yep, yeah. pheasant corn soup, pheasant salad sandwiches. I can't make the pheasant salad sandwiches. I don't do that because people will say, well, this doesn't taste like hers, you know. She just, yeah. she made her own pickles and, you know, the old fashioned way. And we'll also do that for corporate hunts and <clears> things <throat> like that as well. If somebody right. comes in and does, you know, sometimes a corporation might come in and they might want to do field hunts and they might have five different groups of four hunters in a group and you know they could come back and get a meal made as well that way. And they have options too as far as the type of meal that they want. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, They can have a chicken dinner if they want or they can have soup sandwiches. A lot of guys like something involving pheasant. Right. Yeah, pheasant corn soup, pheasant salad sandwiches, that kind of thing. Okay. We do, oh, I'm sorry. No, I was ahead. just going to say to answer your question, we do have two lodges. We have the upstairs convenience apartment here at our clubhouse office that can accommodate four to five people. And then we also have a more of a rustic hunting lodge. It's a house that can accommodate up to 12 people comfortably. So that's our, our lodging that we have. Okay. Is it okay if we go up and take a look at some of the lodging? A absolutely. Sure. Okay. sure. Yep. All right. We are here up in the clubhouse um, at the main part of the um, Mars's Game Farm. And with us today, we have Pam Hood, who's been employed here for how long? Since 1999. Um, she must really like her job to still be here doing this. Um, they're very busy here. But Pam's going to tell us a little bit about the reservation process and if you want to stay over and what this accommodation includes. When you come for a hunt or call in to make a reservation for a hunt, you can book this lodge up here. We have a second lodge off-site. 
but this one accommodates approximately four people. Now we did add the futon and you can put per one person there if you would like to. Uh, most of the time this is good for four because we have three beds and the couch opens up and that gives them enough space. They can cook here. Um, some of the guys do. Most of them elect to go out to some of the local restaurants because it's convenient and most guys don't like to cook. <laughs> <laughs> So when they're, I mean, we're in a very rural part of um, the 108th Legislative District, so I'm sure the local restaurants and businesses love having um, uh, people they, come in from out of the area. They really appreciate their business, and we actually have a local restaurant that will make something. We can go pick it up. The guys can eat up here. They can eat in the basement. They can eat on the main floor. And, and just, I mean, I live here, but um, not everybody does. The local fair here um, has a lot of Dutch influence on it. So what would a typical meal consist of down this way? Most of the guys do the subs because that's what they're familiar with. If we have like chicken and waffles, they're like, that doesn't even sound like it's any good. <laughs> because that's <laughs> stuff that we eat, but they don't know that stuff. That, that food is unfamiliar to them. Okay. So Pam, if somebody wanted to come, you know, set up a shoot here, how far in advance would they need to call or how does that process work for them? Well, that's kind of a tough question because the weekdays are more available. The weekends fill up quite quickly. So what I suggest when they call in is ask them, I ask them if they have a date in mind. If they're, everything's available that they can get, we'll gladly take the reservation. If not, I'll give them some alternate dates. They can talk to their friends and cut back to us on that. That's the easiest way to handle it for them and for us. But are there times of the year that are busier than other times? I would say any time November is really busy because the cover is at its best, November, December, and the week between Christmas and New Year because everyone's off of school. Thanksgiving when everyone's off of school, they like to bring their sons here, their daughters here. So that's a good time. Kids are home from college and it gets very busy then. And do you have a lot of repeat business coming here? We do. Um, we have customers that have been coming here for 30 some years. There's actually a group here today that we should try to talk to at some point. It was five, six brothers? How many to There's start? There's five, five brothers. And there's still four of them that come on a regular basis. So it sort of becomes a family tradition. Yes. And there was a guy on Saturday that was hunting here that uh, started hunting here in 1959. Oh, wow. And I think he's the, I think he's the oldest, maybe not the oldest person, but the oldest uh, hunter here as far as time, you know, hunted here. So. There's yeah, a and it's interesting. And you, when they start bringing their kids, a lot of times you can barely see their heads above the counter downstairs. And then they get taller and taller every year. And it's interesting to see the kids grow. But I know uh, when we were talking a little bit downstairs, we had seen photos of, you know, the employees throughout the years. And mm. a lot of the kids that work here, you know, through high school and college, uh, go on to be very, very successful. And that's attributed to the hard work it takes to do farming in a business like this. Well, we'd like to think so. I mean, it's, hopefully it can be a positive influence on them, you know, that way from a work ethic standpoint. So it's my understanding that there is some Olympic training that goes on here, um, and I would assume that some of them probably stay here? Yes, yeah, a, a lot of them actually stay here. That's another uh, accommodation for them. And most of the time, the nice thing is when the Olympic trap shooting uh, range is very busy, we're not as busy during hunting season, and vice versa. So, it, you know, it kind of works out really nice that way. And is that only um, trap shooters from the United States that stay here? Or? No, it's actually international. Uh, there's c Canadians and some Europeans that actually have shot here. And uh, Canadians come here pretty regular. And when they come here, how long are they in this area? Or uh, You know, it varies. Sometimes I'd say up to four or five days, sometimes two or three days. I do want to say we don't own the Olympic range. And, uh, you know, it's something that we lease. So I don't want to take any credit for the guy that did all the work on right. it, Alan Chubb. They're located here and They're you do a partnership here. with yeah. them. Yeah. So it, it's safe to say that right now we're going to head over and take a look at um, sure the thing. Olympic trap and shooting? We actually have an Olympic shooter to talk a little bit about that can talk circles around us about shooting. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Thank you. Before we leave the clubhouse, we wanted to talk to you about some other little-known services that are available to the public. And with me today is Roxy Sheasley. Roxy's an employee here for how many years? Well, 25. 25 years. So I would assume you know most of what goes on here. Um, something I'm just learning about is um, a service the public can use, and it's the birds that you offer here. Um, it's the uh, smoked and the fresh birds. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, these are all birds that we have raised um, here on the farm, 
and then we set a day aside and we dress them and soak them out and uh, we cry back them in these special packages and have them here in the freezer so that if someone comes in for the holidays and wants to serve a bird that hasn't been shot we have them here and they can purchase the dress birds and then we also get some of the birds smoked so that we have a smoked bird which is nice uh, if you want that smoked flavor and we sell a lot of these around the holidays all year though the men like them so for somebody who hasn't had pheasant um, it's a comparable taste to what well you can prepare a pheasant any way you can do the chicken or a duck or what have you and so um, it has a taste of its own but can be prepared just like a chicken or, or any of the fowl birds could be prepared uh, stuffing them and roasting them or um, like having the pheasant and waffles with gravy is always good. Do they have to call in advance to order these or can I just stop it by? Most people do call in advance and ask them if we have them in the freezer here if they want to purchase a large amount of them for the holidays but usually we have the frozen ones here and keep them in the case so they'll be ready for them. Now I'm hearing from everybody who's had pheasant uh, they prefer the taste uh, over chicken or over anything else. So that's maybe something everybody should get out and try this holiday season. Right, yes, it is very good and healthy. Uh, Roxy, thank you so much for your time on this. We're going to head outside now and we're going to go over to the Olympic uh, trap shoot. We're now at the uh, Olympic shotgun range here on Marta's Game Farm. And with us we have Annie Jardin, uh, 2016 Olympic hopeful, who is training here. Um, this is kind of exciting for me to be near somebody who <laughs> might be going to the Olympics. Um, but Mike, do you want to tell us how this came to be here at the farm? Yeah, first and foremost, a lot of people think that this is Martz's Gap View Hunting Preserves range, and it's not. We simply lease the property. Uh, the gentleman that started this range, uh, his, his name is Alan Chubb. He's also Annie's uh, Olympic training coach. And he was also a, a trap shoot, Olympic trap shooting Olympian at one time in 1984. I think he was an alternate in the 1988 Olympics. Mm -hmm. So he certainly knows what he's doing as far as setting everything up. Mm -hmm. And we have people from all around the world that come here to train. That's correct. And Annie can tell you a lot more about that because she, she uh, lives it every day. <laughs> okay, Annie, can you tell us a little bit about um, maybe how you got involved in this? Sure. Um, I started shooting when I was 12 years old and got into hunting and just... Uh, ATA trap shooting back home in uh, Mexico, New York. And I met Alan at one of the shoots up there. He was a referee. And I told him I wanted to become an Olympian one day and he kind of took me under his wing and um, he had built this range and it's one of the best in the world. So I uh, just graduated from college, from Paul Smith College up in the Adirondacks in, in May. And now, I've been working on the game farm from 7 to noon and then shoot here every afternoon, every single day to get ready. And how long do you shoot? Um, well, since I'm here every day, I normally shoot about three, four, five rounds a day. So. And then just out of curiosity, what was your degree in? Uh, fisheries and wildlife management. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, so, do you anticipate maybe someday them having, you know, events here, just not training here, but actually holding events here? They do hold a lot of events here. Um, this coming weekend, uh, Alan, my coach, he's hosting a high performance camp. And we've had several matches throughout the summers for the past three years now. So, so now I know you said it's a really long process to qualify mm -hmm. to go to the 2016 Olympics. At what point will we know if you're actually going so we um, can root you on? Not until 2016 at the Olympic trials. Okay. So a ways away. <laughs> okay. And there's a lot of qualifying to do yes. until then. Yep. Uh, Annie, would you do us the pleasure of showing us some of your skills? Sure. Okay. <laughs> Okay, here we are at the range with Annie, and she's going to do a little demonstrating for us. But for those of us who are not familiar with um, the sport of international trap shooting, can you explain to us how this works? Sure. Um, there can be up to six people on a squad, and there's uh, 25 birds in one round, but you do get to shoot uh, two shots at one target. 
So if you do uh, miss it on your first shot, you have a second chance of hitting it again. But if you do hit it on your first shot, you can go after the small pieces that come off the target, but it's no extra points. And on this sport, you get um, two lefts, two rights, and a straightaway. And it angles, the angles on this go from um, 45 degrees left or right of the mark and up to three meters high and any angle in between. So throughout the round, everybody will get the same targets. Um, I'm, you know, I, I'm sitting here marveling what you just said, thinking I could probably not hit any of those targets. <laughs> um, but I did hear, though, for people who are not as good at this as you are and need practice, that the public is able to use this facility. Um, they just would need to call down and ask, and they can get a card, and they can come out and practice as well. Yep. I'm hearing no private lessons uh, here from Annie, but a lot of people <laughs> do ask her for tips on how to improve their shots. So yep. we're going to let you go ahead and do some demonstrating for us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're here um, just off of the Olympic training um, shoot with uh, Don Martz. Don is third generation in the Martz family. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about clay shooting, which is behind us, which is what they originally um, had put here, uh, and the difference between that and the Olympic training. Um, so Don, can you explain a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, we started this sporting clay course in 1989. and. Uh, it's a, different than the ATA type trap shooting and the Olympic trap shooting we just uh, looked at in that it's a walkthrough course uh, and it's not just like a stationary area where you shoot. So you walk through the course and it simulates a lot of different types of shots. Every, every station uh, uh, has a different type of shot and there's oncoming targets, there's targets on the ground and uh, it's more of an instinctive type of, of shooting than what uh, trap shooting would be, and the, it simulates the hunting situation. Um, I've seen it in action, and I can tell you, Don's a very good shot. Um, Don does very well with it, but when they're coming across the ground at you that fast, uh, it's amazing to me that anybody shoots them. Uh, Don, can you tell me, what, are people, do they use this year-round? Um, a lot of people use it to prepare before the hunting season? Yes, it's used year-round, uh, but during the summer months, people aren't really thinking about hunting, you know. They're golfing and fishing, and, and uh, but uh, in the winter months, they do shoot the sporting clays a lot more often and uh, uh, to get in practice for the season. Is that something and, somebody should call ahead and make reservations to do? Yes, yes, okay. it's by reservations only, but uh, it's open year round. Okay, well, thank you very much. All right. Uh, we're here in the fields right now um, so that you can take a look at the terrain and the cover um, that's so important to the people that are hunt here. Uh, Mike or Dong, do you want to explain to us um, what the hunters are looking for, what the differences is, and how you maintain them? Sure. Well, first of all, we got to give credit to our manager, farm manager, Chris Lanker. Uh, he does, you know, a great job with our food plots and our farming and things like that. And also Dennis Mosser, he does most of our shop work and farm equipment and stuff like that. And uh, we have excellent employees, and that's the first thing I want to talk about a little bit. But mainly what hunters are worried about mainly when it comes to pheasant hunting, a true pheasant hunter, is the cover. And uh, the primary cover that, of choice that we use is sorghum. And uh, it's a Pioneer variety, 85G85. And you can see that right out there, some sorghum plots. Now the reason some of it looks green and some of it looks dead is we do it in two different plantings. And the reason we do that is because if we get bad weather early in the year, like real dry or too wet, uh, kind of like hedges our bed a little bit on good cover. Uh, if people are saying the cover is great this time of year, that's usually a bad thing because we want the cover to be really thick this time of year. So when we get a frost, uh, it'll kill it down a little bit. 
And uh, you know, pheasant hunting cover without that, you don't have a hunting preserve. That's the bottom line. Uh, we also have switchgrass plots uh, up above the green sorghum that you see right there. Uh, that's a perennial grass that does not need planted every year. You know, it's, once it's established, it just regrows every year. And the sorghum plots, we spend a lot of money on, and uh, we take that very serious for our hunters. You know, we plant that every year. And uh, then we have some other, you know, natural habitat that you can see. Uh, most of our preserve is what we advertise the rolling hills of central Pennsylvania. So you can see, you know, it is a little bit in the hilly side. However, for, uh, we have uh, 19 different areas in the hunting preserve, all ranging from 25 to 70 acres per area. And some of the areas, if we have older hunters or people with a, some type of disability, we have some level areas for people like that. So uh, we try to cater to everybody that we possibly can. Um, I know people when they hunt sometimes like to use dogs. Um, and I know the website says, you know, they can bring their own dog or perhaps you can provide them with one. Yeah, we have dogs and dog handlers and uh, I'd say 80% of the people that hunt here bring their own dogs though. And, uh, you know, a lot of people say what kind of dogs normally I'd say, you know, your, your German short hairs, your Labradors and, you know, Brittany's and Setters are, you know, most of the time your most popular dogs that people use here. Okay. I want to thank you for having us here today and explaining how, you know, the preserve works and the farm works. Um, I know we've had a lot of questions out about it over the years. Um, I'm sure a little known fact was the Olympic training range that we have here. Uh, if you have any questions about hunting here, the farm here, or the training, um, you can call the Marcus Game Farm. Um, this has been your legislative report. I'm Representative Linda Schlegel Culver. I want to thank you for joining us for this report. If you have any questions or concerns, please call my office uh, either in Harrisburg or the district at any time. Thank you.